Righty ho. Okay, we're going to keep moving on, folks. Um, the evaluation forms have now landed on your table, so if you wouldn't uh, mind taking a moment and starting to look over those and fill those as we go, because it's very, very important for us to uh, get all that feedback and make sure that we know what you liked, what you didn't like, what we could improve on, um, what your thoughts are. So very, very important, as that would shape any future event. So session three, can't believe it, the day has flown by already, is optimizing ecosystem services from our land and seas. So I'm really looking forward to this one. Your chair for this session is Mr. Peter Jan Sean, Director of AFB's Environmental and Marine Sciences Division. So Peter Jan, it's over to you. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, last but not least, um, the focus on uh, enhancing our natural environment and uh, marine environment. Um, but uh, just before I start, you know, the concept of ecosystem services is sometimes a difficult one to grasp, and people always think of it in, t in the environmental con context. But it's actually uh, focusing on humans and the benefits to humans. Um, and it's uh, the, um, you know, the, the direct and indirect contributions that uh, ecosystems can make to the well-being of, of humans and the impact on our survival and well-being. So the concept only goes to the environment once you look at uh, the environment, the natural environment and healthy ecosystems is actually providing those ecosystem services, which include, uh, in the context of uh, most of today's discussion, food production and agriculture. It's an ecosystem service. Um, but on that note, I like to introduce our first speaker, which unfortunately can't be with us uh, today, but um, we have a recorded uh, a lecture from her similar to the first session. And our first speaker is Dr. Lisa Norton, um, from, which is a senior scientist in the land use group at the UK Center of Ecology and Hydrology. Uh, she has worked as a plant and landscape ecologist for over 20 years, and a research focus on the monitoring and management of natural capital for ecosystem service delivery. Um, and she's very much following an interdisciplinary approach to sustainable environmental management and farmland. Uh, she led the countryside survey program for 10 years and continues to lead this work um, with DEFRA and the use of the countryside survey data for the 25 year environmental plan in the UK. Uh, she's currently leading a range of uh, projects including the Northern Ireland countryside survey which has just started off uh, DEFRA research on the impact of environment schemes on hedgerows, uh, innovative work on seed mixtures for permanent grassland is engaged in the national and European research on livestock farming systems and biodiversity science provision to policy. So it's a good wide range of expertise and very much fitting within the, the uh, uh, you know, theme of the session. So with that, over to Lisa. Okay, hello everyone and thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Uh, I find I'm becoming something of a hibernophile. Who knew that was the word for someone who loves all things Irish? Some of you will know that UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology are working with AFB and with Queen's on a new DARA funded Northern Ireland countryside survey that I'm leading. So whilst I'm not in Northern Ireland today, I will be there reasonably often in the coming years and I may even get to sneak in the odd Ireland or Leinster game if I'm lucky. Anyway, back to the matter in hand. I've been asked to talk from my perspective about approaches for the future farming environment. And my perspective is that of someone who's had a career within the land use group at UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, focused around two key areas. And one of these is long-term, large-scale monitoring of the wider countryside to enable assessment of what we now have and how it's changing. And the other is really working with farmers to address and understand the impacts of farming practices on the environment. 
And now is a really exciting time to be involved in both of these areas. Suddenly, the world seems to be waking up to the need to measure our ecological resources, natural assets, and to help farmers farm in ways which can uh, really benefit the us, us and the environment by providing us with environmental goods, as well as producing food. So those of us in these fields of research are all really busy trying to catch up with ourselves uh, because of the work that's coming our way. And one of the key aspects of monitoring work at UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology in the past, and in particular in the GB countryside survey, has been its integrated nature. So the approach of past surveys was to look at landscapes within a one kilometre sampling square as an ecological unit and surveys involve recording information on soils, vegetation, headwater streams, ponds, landscape features, habitats and land use, a pretty, pretty long list. Um, and, and in fact, in, even in more recent surveys in Wales led by my colleague Bridget Emmett, birds and pollinators have also been reco re recorded as well as all those other things. So this ecologically integrated perspective is really ambitious. Um, and given the fact that the very first GB countryside survey was conducted way back in 1978, uh, it was pretty innovative at that time. And we have uh, Bob Bunce to thank you for that. Um, but this ecological approach recognises that we're really dealing with the whole ecology of systems and that everything is linked together and impacts on each other. So um, just an example of how this integrated data can be used. Um, I'll give you a recent one of when I revisited the survey data from the Countryside Survey in 2007 uh, to look at the relationships between soil and vegetation on managed grassland. So I was working on 100% on pasture fed livestock farms and trying to assess how their approaches impacted on soil and vegetation quality. And to do this, I was using the same method as are used in the countryside survey. Uh, it's useful to do that because it allows you then to have this broad comparison with this much wider sample. Um, and our sample size in the study for farms was relatively constrained. So we had 56 farms in that study uh, and uh, deciding to use the countryside survey data meant that we suddenly had close to a thousand quadrats on GB grassland um, and we could look at those the data from those quadrants to see how above ground plant diversity was linked to below ground soil qualities um, and in brief that analysis showed that increasing species richness above ground in grassland was associated with higher soil carbon and higher soil nitrogen and also higher numbers of macroinvertebrates. So countryside survey is this huge integrated approach to monitoring lots of things in the same place at the same time. And even so, I always felt that the survey wasn't quite as holistic as it could be um, because it didn't include the people by the land managers and the farmers. Now, there are good reasons for this. Already, the research load is pretty heavy on those surveyors going out there in the field and adding in people as another research subject just means more to do. And it also could require different expertise to be talking to those farmers as opposed to measuring soil or vegetation. And resources for these surveys are limited and it's impossible to add everything that everybody wants added in. in. So whilst for me, the key to an in-depth understanding of the land is always to understand the land managers, my research in this area has been in separate projects outside of those large scale monitoring ones. Um, so a few years back, I wrote a discussion piece and it was entitled, Is it time for a socio-ecological revolution in agriculture? Maybe, maybe it was. Uh, and whilst we haven't quite had one yet, there is certainly increasing interest in transforming our agricultural systems towards ones which promote healthy ecological systems. And alongside that, there's been a real recognition that to do that, we need to innovate in close collaboration with all the other actors in the current food systems. Um, otherwise we'll get perverse outcomes. So my recognition of the importance of taking this more holistic approach to agriculture started a fair way back in my career. So I was working with colleagues at Oxford University and with 
colleagues at the British Trust for Ornithology, and we were looking at the effects of organic versus conventional practices on biodiversity, and it was a DEFRA funded project. Um, and in the project, we were looking at different taxa and at landscape level drivers of biodiversity, like the presence of different habitats or non-crop habitats. Um, and I also interviewed farmers about their practices and I discovered then just how valuable it was to gain an understanding from the farmers about their motivations behind their management decisions. Uh, and, and that helped us to understand impacts on biodiversity measures. Uh, and in fact, I have to come clean and say that even as we set up the whole survey sample, we discovered just how unholistically we were thinking. We decided, uh, you know, in our, in our um, scientifically abstract way that we would uh, have X number of farms with X number of fields of this crop type or that crop type. And what we found out, and, and we were looking particularly at winter and spring wheat, and what we found out right from the beginning was that different farming systems actually tend to grow different crops and in totally different rotations. So, um, for example, the organic growers weren't necessarily growing spring wheat. They might be growing triticale or rye instead uh, for, for the reasons that it suited their system better. Uh, and I think that work just sort of highlighted to us that organic systems were very different to conventional ones, and it made us revise our approaches um, in the study. Incidentally, we did find that organic systems were very much better for biodiversity, depending on the taxa you were looking at, but that there was variability across farms, in part due to landscape farm uh, factors, but also due to farmer attitudes and approaches, and that was whether they were organic or not. <clears throat> So after that study, I really came to the decision that my approaches for working with farmers should and would involve social scientists where possible. And, and I was lucky to get some funding uh, through the uh, research, multi-research council, Rural Economy and Land Use Programme, the RELU programme. You may have heard of it. It was a very successful interdisciplinary programme looking at land use. Um, and that was to work on a small catchment in the Lake District, investigating water quality issues uh, with farmers and the wider community in that area. And the work revealed some really the, some of the really serious constraints that upland and small upland farmers particularly uh, uh, are having to face. And it provided them evidence to help them think about their grassland management and the management of their slurry in particular and its potential impacts on lake water quality. So um, after that work, I followed up work with um, uh, of the other social scientists I've been working, other social scientists I've been working with um, to look at slurry. <laughs> Uh, always like to have a nice subject area uh, and as part of that we actually worked with CAFRE a bit and we spoke to a lot of cattle farmers at the Balmoral show I remember it well it was a very uh, a very enjoyable couple of days um, and we were really talking to them to understand the issue of ensuring that waste becomes a resource and not a problem uh, and, and it was really important to take quite different approaches to that and, and these studies and others have indicated that there still remains something of a misconnection between agriculture and ecological understandings of agricultural land. And that's both a problem and a real opportunity for the future. So, as I think we all know, future farming systems need to be transformed um, to help us ensure that the ecosystem service delivery that we need from our land uh, remains adequate. Um, and then it, I think transformation is a new real buzzword in agriculture at the moment. And the BBSRC, the Biology and Biotechnology Research Council have, for example, launched a transforming UK food systems program uh, worth over 47 million, which um, is, is looking to, to, to work on that. And, and I'd say, uh, thankfully, we seem to have moved away from a sustainable intensification uh, bent which to my mind put too much focus on continuing high levels of production in the short term and not enough on moving to systems that will enable us to produce sustainably forever. So I think future agriculture really needs to be based on ecologically functioning landscapes. Those landscapes can't look like green deserts composed of one or two species of plant which have been designed purely for maximal production. 
they need to be complex and biodiverse, full of species that have a wide range of ecological functions and not just production. We need species that have deep roots, shallow roots, tap roots, fibrous roots, mycorrhizal associations, species that have lots of leaves all year round or only at certain times of the year, those that produce food for pollinators as well as food for animals and for us, um, species that do well at, in drought, species that do well in floods or species that don't do particularly well in either and just like general conditions. We need resilient species, we need resilient communities of species within our farmland. Um, and not just that, we need a matrix of vegetation types, so we need a sort of landscape scale diversity as well, a matrix of vegetation structures and landscape features, so fields that are rotated um, where the grazing is rotational, um, so sometimes you have longer swords, sometimes you have swords that are actually allowed to flower, so there are flowers for pollinators within grass fields. Um, we need trees in fields or at least along the field edges as part of hedges or as, as, as hedge standards. We need hedges that are in really proper management cycles so that they are rejuvenated and productive. Uh, and, you know, ideally across any farm, you would want uh, a whole series of hedges in different stages of the management cycle. So you've got this diversity of structure as well as uh, having rejuvenated hedges that are going to be big and deliver for biodiversity and for the farm. And we need animals that suit the land, not just the production needs, that they can produce well, well in terms of their, their, their outputs without high levels of inputs, that they are efficient, and that are multi-purpose. We need to make best use of animal wastes so that they come to be a key part of our nutrient systems and not a waste product that we've got to get rid of. Um, and I think these things are key constituent. There are in, in transformational change, but there is one um, really key constituent who's going to make the difference. And it's the land manager, uh, more often than not the farmer, our land managers are the closest to the land. And whilst modern practices have tended to cause farmers to rely more on inputs and less on their own knowledge of their systems, their connection with the land remains and they are in the really critically placed to make the difference going forward. And I think it's therefore working with farmers to help them measure their practices and adopt more ecological approaches to land management is key. Farmers are already ahead of the game and many like the Nature Farming Friendly Farming Network or Pasture Fed Livestock Association who I've been working with are already um, seeking to work with ecological researchers to validate their approaches and learn more about what works and what doesn't. So I'm going to finish up with just telling you a bit more about that project, which I've just completed, uh, which is with the Pasture Fed Livestock Association. And they wanted evidence uh, to evidence their practices. Uh, and so myself and a group of researchers from the Scottish Rural College, uh, from Lancaster University and from Reading worked with them on this. And we, we didn't dictate their practices, but we sought to evidence what they do. And this is difficult science, it's difficult science. As scientists, we really like to put things in boxes. We like to reduce uh, the messiness. Um, but the reality is that things aren't in boxes and farmers really like to tinker and adapt to their own conditions or to the weather or what from it or whatever and so our science needs to work together with that and still try and come out with some uh, valid measurements for farmers that they can use to help shape their practices and there's many messages from that work with the PFLA um, and one of those is that you need time to find out for what what's going on because sometimes things do take time. We found that farmers that were PFLA members for longer tended to be the ones with more diverse swards and higher soil carbon. Um, and though we did find in general that PFLA farmers had higher sward diversity than found in, in the wider countryside. We found that mob grazing um, this sort of novel practice, or maybe not novel, but relatively that seems to be going about very much at the moment, has many different meanings for different farmers. It's a relatively new practice, um, but and, and many farmers are therefore on a journey to work out 
how they can mob gaze on their own farms, what's going to work for them. We found that positive, proactive attitudes of those farmers were really prevalent. And we found that also they fared better economically than the average for the farm business survey. So some really positive findings from working with those farmers. We also did a little bit of consumer work in that study, and this really highlighted what consumers don't actually know and the key roles of food processors and retailers in all of this in looking at agriculture and agricultural change. So I think going forward, we absolutely need to be thinking about whole food systems. We need to see change coming from farmers in bottom up approaches supported by science and policy and change also coming through retailers and processors taking responsibility for their roles in the system, as well as change driven by top down policy makers and, and public. So finally, I just want to say that uh, if farmers recognise that their farming now and in the future fundally, fundamentally relies on functioning ecosystems, they themselves will be the most powerful force for driving change. And I think that's something for us to be really positive about. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much to Lisa for the very stimulating talk on an holistic approach to uh, farming and environmental management going forward. Um, and it's good to also hear her views that uh, land managers and farmers, uh, you know, managing our soils and other natural assets like hedgerows and woodlands and small watercourses are most certainly part of the solution to restore the imbalance and ensure true uh, long-term sustainability. So that was uh, a good introduction. So our next se section of this session then moves on to the AFP speakers um, with a series of talks on uh, focusing on some aspects of uh, optimizing ecosystem services uh, and restoring this to, to help us restoring this uh, imbalance uh, going, you know, and uh, and uh, while also delivering on short term solutions. So our first speaker is Dr. Archie Murchie, who is currently the acting head of AFPI's Grassland and Plant Science Branch. Uh, his background is in uh, entomology and his 25 years of postdoctoral research experience in agriculture and environmental science. Um, his research concerning with the surveillance and monitoring of pests and pathogens and plants and the use of functional biodiversity and sustainable agriculture production and the targeted management of pest species. So we're gonna you know, hear from Archie on the important uh, of role ecosystem service that trees can provide to us. That's all well published, but also uh, some of the challenges we are facing with that. Archie. Um, thank you very much, uh, Peter Jan, for that introduction. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking about protecting plants. Um, we've had discussions earlier today uh, to do with uh, protecting animals and animal health. So I'm moving on to a slightly different phase now to talk about plants. So first off, um, what is plant health? Um, well, plants get attacked by a whole range of diseases, bacterial, fungal, and viral diseases. And they also get eaten by insects and nematodes. And globally, um, this impact on food production results in a loss of about 20 to 40 percent. So when we um, talk about plant health in a legislative way, we're really talking about invasive crop pests. So these are pests and diseases we want to try and keep out of Northern Ireland. Uh, but this is really part of a continuum uh, with plant protection, which is dealing with uh, endemic pests and diseases, such as leather jackets here, and also environmental protection, uh, which is dealing with invasive alien species. So these are, are species that are not necessarily causing an economic loss, but they're causing an environmental impact. 
So why is it important uh, that we protect plants, we have good plant health? Well, on a global scale, we rely on plants for 82% uh, of our calorie consumption. And even when we look at uh, protein consumption, 63% of that globally, uh, varies from country to country, uh, depends on direct consumption of plants. And if we look, if we exclude fisheries uh, from the meat production, then our livestock also rely on plants. And uh, again, uh, if we perhaps take grass, I realize we're very much a, a grass-based agricultural system, but if we take grass out of the equation, then we import uh, a lot of our, our, of our livestock feed from other countries. So plant health matters not only locally, but also internationally. And I, I can't um, give a talk on plant health in Ireland, uh, unfortunately, without mentioning uh, potato blight and the Great Famine in Ireland, uh, which occurred from 1845 to the early 1850s. And this was really due to over-reliance on a single potato variety called lumper, uh, and which was unfortunately susceptible uh, to potato blight by toffler infestans, um, which actually is, is a disease that arose originally in Mexico, but then spread throughout Europe and eventually reached Ireland. And the upshot of this was that one million people died, uh, two million people emigrated at least, and to put it into a local context, about 30% uh, of the population of Fermanagh uh, were, were lost, either to emigration uh, or worse. So moving back really to the, the topic um, of this conference, uh, carbon, um, we rely on plants for our oxygen and to fix uh, carbon from the atmosphere. And this carbon is fixed in the leaf material and the trunks and in the branches and also in the roots. And the roots serve as a method for carbon sequestration into the soil. And I know that um, the following speaker, Jonathan, uh, will be talking about that in more detail. So trees are a living carbon store. Um, they're a pathway for soil sequestration. Um, they can be a carbon neutral fuel. And they can also be a carbon neutral building material. So for example, uh, in countries like Finland where they have large forest resources, they're looking at using wood and new ways uh, to replace concrete and steel in building and therefore reduce the carbon footprint. Um, so uh, because of that, uh, the department has, has a great interest in increasing our tree cover. Uh, currently in Northern Ireland, about 9% of our land is covered by forest, which is actually pretty low on a European scale. In Europe, it's actually an average of about 38%. So there is scope to increase our tree cover. And the department has engaged in the Forest for Our Future program, which aims to plant about 18 million trees on 9,000 hectares of new woodland over the next 10 years. And that's climate change mitigation, but it's also for a whole variety of other reasons. It's nice to have forests and they aid in biodiversity, they're nice places to go and visit. Um, however, there's a bit of a problem, uh, and that's pests and diseases. So this slide here, um, just to the left, um, shows a horse chestnut leaf that has been infected by horse chestnut leaf miner, uh, which is a little moth that came in from the continent about eight years ago. And what the moth does is it lays its egg in the leaf, and then the larval stage just burrows it way, its way through the leaf layer. And each of these blotches, as you can see here, is actually a, a little larva just eating its way through the leaf. Um, now, there's more than one <laughs> leaf miner there. There's probably several thousand on that tree. So numbers can build up rapidly, and they reduce the ability of the tree to, to fix, um, to photosynthesize carbon dioxide um, from the air. Now, horse chestnut leaf miner uh, is not, it doesn't kill the tree. Uh, it certainly weakens it and reduces its vigor, but it doesn't kill it. Um, this fellow here is an ash tree, and it's infected by ash dieback, uh, which is a fungus that was found uh, first in Northern Ireland about 10 years ago, and again, has spread from Asia right across Western Europe. 
and ash dieback does kill trees. And it, it's a very, very sad disease. As you drive out of, of the hotel uh, later this afternoon, you will see trees that are dying because of ash dieback. And that's bad news. It's bad news in terms of removing carbon. It's bad news in terms of biodiversity. And also, there's, there's health and safety issues because a lot of our ash trees are grown beside roads and pathways. So in stormy weather, you, you'll get branches falling off, you'll get trees collapsing onto roads. Another disease uh, that's been with us for about 20 years is Phytophthora remorum. It's related to potato blight, Phytophthora infestans, so it's a, a similar umycid water mold. And it, it in particular, uh, uh, infects larch. And what the department did, the Forest Service did, in response to this, as part of legislation, uh, was to fell a lot of our larch. Um, so you can see, just the top left is the larch trees that are showing infection by Phytophthora remorum. And then the notice here to say that felling is process and the end result. Okay, so the timber can still be used, but we're removing these trees prematurely from our forest ecosystems. So um, what's happened in the past few years is we've seen a bit of an escalation in the number of pests and diseases coming in. And this just is just a species distribution curve for the island of Ireland. And we can see it's not really tailing off, it's, it's on the up. And um, part of the reason for that is that we've seen a tremendous amount of, of trade. We've seen globalization, we, we've seen uh, more uh, food stuff, more material moved around, moved quicker and in better condition, and particularly coming in from Asia into Europe. Secondly, we have a feedback loop. So uh, with warmer, milder winters, with, with drier conditions, these tend to benefit certain pests and diseases. And also things like drought uh, will, will stress our trees, making them more susceptible to pests and diseases. So what we do in AFBE is we work very closely uh, with the department and we try and keep these pests and diseases out. And we have a great advantage in Northern Ireland uh, because we're an island of an island. So we can see a lot of these pests and diseases coming firstly from Europe, and secondly from GB. And if we just show this species, uh, sorry, this uh, invasion curve, which is time against abundance, and we, we, when invaders first arrive, you don't notice them because they're low numbers, and then they go through exponential growth towards a sort of carrying capacity. But where we want to work at in AFBE and with the department is very much in this quarantine stage, so prevention is better than cure. Because once we go beyond that, uh, the costs start to increase. Yeah. My button's not working. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> I'll probably jump on his head. Um, so we, we dry, uh, when, when a new pest or invader arrives in, uh, you, you then have to eradicate it as quickly as possible, hence the sort of felling. And then once you go into a control stage is to, to prevent it spreading and then Beyond that, it goes into a long-term management stage. And that's what we want to try and avoid for as long as possible. So future threats to trees. Um, there's a number of the rise, and I've, I've just sort of mentioned these. Uh, I'm not going to go through them in any, any great detail, but just to point out uh, the first one here, emerald ash borer, which as an entomologist is a remarkably pretty beetle, but it's also very damaging. Um, it's currently in Western Europe, uh, and in the Ukraine, and of course, there's lots of issues going on there with the war, and that's certainly not going to help or prevent this pest from uh, being restricted. Uh, we have Ipsembri uh, in Larch, uh, which is currently on the west coast of Scotland, and we've currently placed an embargo, really an importation of Larch trees that have bark on them to prevent uh, the spread of this uh, particular pest. And then at the very bottom, there's another Ips species, Ips typographus, uh, which is, is a very damaging pest of spruce. And spruce is our sort of major economic timber crop. Um, so it's currently been blown in to southern England uh, 
and um, so it's not that far away. And it becomes established, and we'll be facing sort of economic damage. Um, we have two approaches uh, in terms of our plant health surveillance. Uh, the first of which is to assist our plant health inspectors. So that is really from portal inspections. So the inspectors, if they find anything suspicious, any disease material, any insect pests, they'll bring them to us and we'll try and identify them and provide advice. Secondly, and actually what takes up the bulk of our work is detection surveys. Uh, and this is working really under sort of EU regulations. We are still bound uh, in Northern Ireland uh, in plant health um, un under the EU. And we have to, in order to place some restrictions on trade and certain materials coming in, we have to demonstrate that we don't have pests and diseases. So we have to go and look for them and, and hopefully not find them. Um, so we have about 23 uh, priority, um, sorry, 23 protected zone species that we look for. This is pests and diseases. Um, about 20 priority pests uh, that we survey for uh, annually. And then we have over about 180 that we have to report on to the EU um, on a rolling sort of five-year um, sort of period. So uh, just lastly, to, to, to finish up with a, a bit of an example, um, th these are some of the challenges we face. Um, so these were, were trees um, that were imported from Italy. And the councils uh, imported these trees uh, for, for, for very good reasons. They wanted to, to have them as living Christmas trees. Um, so this is instead of you know, felling a tree and decorating it and then disposing of it, um, they wanted to, to have these as living trees. Um, but they imported them, I say, from Italy because they, they, they couldn't really source them locally. And the problem for us is that these live trees uh, arrive, um, they have root balls, they're wrapped in plastic, and we have to, to work with the inspectors to, to try and determine if there's a risk there. So essentially what is coming in is, is a living ecosystem, including um, you know, a live lizard and various other. So it, it's a huge task to, to make a judgment call on that. Um, so our, our preference is very much, um, don't risk it. You know, if you can avoid bringing in plant material from abroad, please do so. So uh, in conclusion, um, just to, to go back a little bit to, to the purposes of, of the, the theme of the, the conference, if we look at ash dieback, and it has the potential to kill about 70% of our ash trees, uh, that's going to remove the ability of these trees um, to fix about 42,000 tonnes per annum uh, of carbon. And that's, that's equivalent, just as sort of ballpark figures, to putting about 25,000 extra cars on the road. Okay, so that's a single disease affecting a single tree species. Um, I say perhaps uh, on a wider, to, to come back to uh, what Peter Yan was saying in terms of the ecosystem services, if we lose ash trees in the same way that we, lo we lost elm trees, then it has a knock-on effect on biodiversity. And there's 955 species associated with ash trees, of which 45 species are dependent on ash. Okay, so th th these are implications that we're not quite sure of how they'll pan out. Um, to try and end on a positive though, uh, approximately one to five percent of our ash trees show some tolerance to ash dieback. So they seem pretty resistant. And some of the work that we are doing in AFBE is, is looking to identify these trees and to try and work out wh why this is happening, why they're not affected uh, by ash dieback disease. There are other species as well that can fill the gap, and there are more than 60 species of ash worldwide. And this might be a bit of a, a, a sort of controversial issue, but one of the, the ways is to actually go back to where the disease or the pest came from and take some of the, the, the trees from there that are adapted to this pest, that have evolved with it, and use them instead. And I think it's part of a wider discussion uh, in forestry and also in crops about what, what we do in the future. Um, how do we mitigate against climate change? What trees do we plant? What crops do we grow? And there's going to be challenges there, but there might also be opportunities as well. Um, 
And just lastly to say, uh, really, prevention is better than cure. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Archie, for, uh, again, a very stimulating talk. So our next speaker uh, is Dr. Jonathan Holland from uh, AFP's Agri-Environment Branch. Uh, now, Jonathan, um, at previous positions at the James Hutton Institute in the UK, New South Wales Department of Primary uh, Industries, and the Charles Sturt University in Australia. So Jonathan has gained about 20 years of uh, experience and great depth in soil science research and crop science on a widely different uh, uh, crops and soils across the UK and Australia. Jonathan, please. And sorry, just before Jonathan come up, can I ask for some renewed enthusiasm there on Sligo, Slido, please, and uh, uh, post some questions, please. Thank you, PJ. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to focus on soil, as you might have guessed from the introduction, and in particular trying to think about trade-offs. So I think that fits in well with the theme in terms of carbon and beyond. So just a very quick overview in terms of just thinking about some of the factors which we should be considering when we're thinking about soil carbon sequestration. And, uh, <clears throat> and then the approach I'm going to take is to look at different land uses and a selection of management practices and consider their effects. But really I'm just doing that because I want to move on to the trade-offs. And so in terms of a trade-off, I think this figure um, will hopefully illustrate the point in terms of, of what I'm focusing on. So if we have a land use or a management practice where we increase the soil carbon, uh, if at the same time there is an indicator or a measure uh, in terms of production or the environment that's decreased, then in that case we would say there is a trade-off. Um, ideally, we want to have synergies and in terms of thinking about ecosystem services, what we're really after is to, to encourage and to achieve multiple benefits. So if we, if we think about uh, soil carbon and, and above ground carbon at a global scale, then it's interesting to consider where we are on Earth in terms of our latitude. So if we, if we go close to the tropics, then we have a much uh, greater amount uh, of, of above ground carbon. But you can see that little arrow there where we are approximately a latitude um, in Northern Ireland. And at this point, uh, there is a very great importance in terms of the soil or the below ground carbon. So that's, that's a, a, a one fundamental principle we need to consider, but much of the soil science work and much of the focus in terms of policy is at a more local level where we're considering all sorts of different biological and chemical processes. We're thinking about atmospheric processes and we're thinking about the management practices. And uh, <clears throat> we could spend a lot of time on this slide getting right down into um, the microbiota and biological uh, aspects, um, but I think for this purposes of today, we just want to recognize that that is very important for us to consider our trade-offs. So as I said, just a, a few selected uh, land uses, thinking about um, the, the, these ones listed here. Um, and, and I should have said at the outset that my focus mostly throughout this presentation is on grasslands, and that's really because grasslands are so important uh, land use across Northern Ireland. 
Um, but a lot of the principles I'm talking about, they can be applied to arable and other lands, other, other land uses. And then in terms of management practices, um, just a small selection there and we could increase it, but just in terms of, of time, uh, we've just got a small select list. And then just a note here on how I'm going to um, illustrate things on the coming slides. So if, uh, if there's a trade-off, depending what our um, objective is, we, we might think of a trade-off as being positive or negative. Mostly we'd think of it as being negative. In some cases where you see a, a question mark, that's because we're, we're not really sure about the effect or there's uncertainty. Um, and uh, <coughs> the, the, the trade-off, I've sort of tried to simplify it in terms of, of the soil organic carbon and, and comparing that with, with an indicator of production or the soil carbon and an indicator of the environment. And so I've given examples there um, which, which will come up in subsequent slides. So, so that's the sort of the, the framework or the, the notation system I'm using um, just to explain that. Hopefully that's clear. So this study from England, it was a sort of modelling study, but um, it was, was based on good data. I think it's, it's interesting to consider um, with, with various um, uh, policy drivers to, to think about when we compare land uses, such as uh, arable land with uh, rough grazing, and we can see there um, the different levels of, of soil carbon stocks. And I've just got a picture there of an example uh, bioenergy crop. If we think about trade-offs, then in this situation, um, we would say that um, under the rough, rough grazing, we have an increase in the, the soil carbon, but in terms of production, it was reduced. And so that's why I've indicated there is a, a trade-off. In terms of the environment, we've actually most likely got greater biodiversity and so in that situation, it's, it would be classified as a synergy. I have to say that uh, <coughs> if we zoomed in, I'm just giving selected examples to illustrate the point, but if we zoomed in on each of the examples I'm giving, we could potentially come to other conclusions if we chose other indicators. And so, so I think it is a complex area, but, but please bear with me on these examples. Um, but I, you know, if questions come up later, then I probably uh, would have to agree that I have simplified things for the purposes of what we're talking about today. So if we move closer to home, um, and, and uh, it's already been mentioned by Archie, uh, the, um, the Loch Gall agroforestry experiment, which has been going for a number of years now, and measurements were done in, I think it was 2015, looking at the, the carbon, and, and what I'm showing here is the total carbon in the soil. And so it's, it's a little bit different from what David showed earlier in terms of only that more stable form of carbon on the silt and clay fractions. But we won't get into all the, the minutiae at the moment. In this instance, um, we actually have more carbon in the soil under the grassland compared to the woodland. And so in this instance, um, if we think about the trade-offs, then there would be a, a trade-off in terms of um, uh, we, we've got greater carbon in the grassland, but there would be most likely reduced biodiversity. So in terms of the environment, there is a trade-off, but in terms of the, um, when we compare the carbon with the production, there is actually a synergy um, if, if, we, if we look at this example here. But <clears throat> if we go up to another scale and think about the whole ecosystem, of course, you'd have to bring in the above ground carbon and so the scenario would, would change. Moving on with um, ploughing and reseeding, which is an uh, important consideration. Um, so there's a study done by Dario Fornara and Alex Higgins and they looked at about 500 fields across Northern Ireland and <coughs> when they looked at the, the tillage and the reseeding frequency over the past 50 years, they didn't find any significant effect in terms of the soil carbon stocks. However, when they looked at only the carbon concentration, there was a significant uh, negative relationship. And so that's, that's basically saying that if you're 
uh, plowing and reseeding more frequently, it's actually not so uh, good in terms of the, the carbon in the soil. So because of this, and because it's really only just one study we're looking at, my conclusion is that there is uncertainty. If anything, we'd be leading towards a, a trade-off in terms of the production and carbon side of things. Um, and uh, from what I could gather, the study um, didn't really consider the environment so much. So it, again, a bit of uncertainty on that one. Another study Dario did before he joined AFB, um, he teamed up with people at Rothamsted and looked at uh, the park grass experiment where they introduced liming back in the 1930s. And so very um, uh, helpful piece of data there confirming the benefit of liming in terms of, of carbon. And uh, so if we, if we th talk about the, um, the trade-offs and synergies, this is a great example of a win-win because we actually have um, increased uh, production, which is a well-known uh, result from liming, um, but you also have greater um, soil carbon. So, so that's, that's uh, very encouraging. You should also note that um, on the, the secondary y-axis, we have soil pH. So over on the, uh, the, the right-hand y-axis, you'll see that the, um, the greater pH um, from the liming, and, and typically uh, that would suggest you'd have greater soil biodiversity. And so again, in this scenario, I'd have to say that there is a synergy in terms of the carbon and the environment. So that's just one indicator there. And if we take this uh, example and we, we go forward to the soil nutrient health scheme, then I think there's, there's um, potential um, advantages that we can uh, think about. So if we go back to what was done a few years ago, the EAA scheme, um, and John Bailey and others, they, they looked at what the liming requirements was across Northern Ireland. And, and with the soil nutrient health scheme coming out, um, then, then this is going to provide farmers with information. And so in terms of identifying the areas that need liming, but also there can be that potential benefit um, from the liming on the carbon sequestration. So that's something um, to look forward to in the future. So um, another area of work done by um, AFB, we're very privileged to have um, had the foresight of previous colleagues who established a liming experiment back in 1970. So it's a, it's a um, very significant long-term experiment um, in terms of this country and also across the world um, for the type of experiment it is. So we have eight different treatments with two different slurry types and different rates as well as an inorganic fertilizer treatment. And in um, 2019, there was um, an innovation and the innovation was basically to introduce a multi-species sward. So those yellow colored uh, plots that you can see on the uh, experimental design, they are where the multi-species plots were, were uh, reseeded. So <coughs> um, just a couple of years, well, last year actually, we, we were fortunate enough to, to celebrate 50 years of this experiment. So, so this is just an introduction uh, to this experiment, which is a um, great value for us. And, and so, one example of that is, is here. So if we, if we, we've got all this, um, this 50 years of data where we can look at the long-term effects on different treatments. And in this case, we're looking at uh, the, this, the total carbon stock over those years. Um, I won't go into all the treatments, but you can see there is, there is quite a variation in terms of, of the accumulation of carbon. And at the highest rate, the, the cow slurry um, does, does, is able to, to accumulate significant amounts of carbon um, and you can see the, even the control where it doesn't receive any, any inputs at all, there has been a, um, a significant increase um, over the last 50 years. So in terms of um, the, the uh, <coughs> production side of things, if we just think about that high um, cow as an example, we're getting the greatest um, biomass or grass yield, and at the same time, you're getting the greatest amount of soil carbon. So in that case, you'd have to say there's a synergy. However, I should add 
that in terms of the environment, there is a significant risk for um, atmospheric and, and nitrogen leaching. And so in that situation, you'd have to say that there would be um, a, a trade-off in terms of the environment, so a, de a decrease uh, potential there. Just uh, in terms of going forward, um, we haven't got the data yet, but one of the interesting questions is to, to look at uh, the effects of those multi-species swords that we've introduced in 2019 and, and how, how there's changes there in terms of, of the soil carbon stocks. Have to wait uh, a little bit before we get these data. So moving um, on in terms of another factor, this sort of connects well with what uh, David said earlier in terms of the importance of plant species. And in this study, um, from England, they even showed just comparing different perennial ryegrass varieties that it's possible to see species effects. And this is not going into distinctly different species. So I think there is um, significant potential um, on, 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 on this question um, of, of looking at species and cultivars in terms of soil carbon stocks. So. Here is a photograph of the multi-species sward that we have at the long-term slurry experiment. And, and in this other figure, you can see um, when we look at a whole range of different species, ones that David mentioned, like chicory and plantain and others, we can see very different rooting structures for the species. And so this is one of the reasons why we're interested and why there's uh, a great potential for increased um, soil carbon sequestration. So in this situation, I have to say that it's still early days. Uh, there are some hopeful signs, but, but in general, in terms of the production side, it, it's, it's probably um, it's still a little bit of conflicting evidence out there, but, but uh, in, in terms of saying it's definitely a trade-off or definitely a synergy. In terms of the environment, I think there's a, a significant amount of evidence to suggest that this would be a, a synergy. So moving sort of back as it were, to the long-term uh, uh, slurry experiment, which, which we've got a lot of data on, and so, so this is where I'm sort of digging in a little bit deeper in terms of the trade-offs. And so just bear with me a moment just while I sort of uh, explain myself. So a great way to, to understand uh, these things is to have um, a range of, of treatments. And so in this case, we've, with these, all these different s treatments, we have uh, significantly differences in terms of the, the nitrogen inputs. And so when we, when we calculate a net ecosystem nitrogen balance, then, and, and that's over the 50 years, then, then we can work out which treatment is retaining nitrogen or which treatment is potentially losing nitrogen. And so the ones that are losing nitrogen, that's you know, through leaching or it's atmospherically. And, and, that, and this is just basically thinking about it in terms of positive uh, net balance or a negative net balance. And so these two slides here, I'm just illustrating the point about um, that, that synergy that I mentioned earlier where we see uh, the, the highest treatment, so that's the high um, cow slurry treatment, it has the greatest um, biomass grass yield and at the same time it has the greatest cumulative soil carbon. So this is just a way to sort of further emphasize what I was referring to in terms of the, uh, those trade-offs. But, but you should also recognize that that, that occurs with the, the, the negative um, net ecosystem N balance. And so hence, hence there is a, a significant N uh, leaching risk. So that just sort of basically confirms what I was, I was saying earlier um, in, in terms of, of those trade-offs and synergies. If we move on in terms of, of another aspect and we consider the species diversity, so this is, bear in mind, before we put in those multi-species um, plots, so this is considering the data from 1970 to 2018. And so in 1970, it was, it was uh, seeded at that point as a, as a perennial ryegrass swarm, but over the years, we've had other um, grass species and other species come in. Um, but at that high nutrient level, those high slurry treatments, you end up with only about four species. Um, and so, so you've got uh, that, that sort of, you do have the high production, but you've got a low number of species. So, so hence, that is a, 
is a trade-off in that example. Um, so it's basically a trade-off for production um, uh, and, and also a trade-off in terms of the environment. So just to, to summarize, um, I have to just emphasize the importance that um, we, we do need to continue to do the fundamental work. Um, I've, I've, I've just used selected examples, but uh, there is a lot of, there's still areas of, of uncertainty and, and if we don't understand those, those soil processes well, then when we get up to the higher level, it's, it's really hard to work out what's going on in terms of, of the effects and then subsequently we, we're really not sure in terms of whether there's trade-offs or synergies. Um, one thing I haven't emphasised too much, which really um, must be said, and that is, especially in Northern Ireland, we have a great diversity in terms of different soil types and soil textures. We have basalt material, granite material, and so on. And so I think that going forward, and, and in terms of management and policy, we really need to um, recognise that spatial variability. And so the implementation of, 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 of practices and and policy needs to have a, a local approach, if at all possible. And then just really just to, to summarise um, the, the, the trade-offs and synergies that I outlined in, in the selected examples earlier. Um, ultimately, we're, we're looking for multiple benefits and, and really to sort of repeat what has been said earlier in terms of a holistic approach is, is important. I think there's still uh, further understanding, and I've only really considered grassland here, there's still further understanding in terms of of trade-offs to do. Uh, however, hopefully what I'm presenting today um, does, does provide um, further um, thoughts on this discussion and, and I think we're, we're certainly um, fortunate to have the experiments we have and have the resources we have at AFPI um, because we are in a strong position um, to, to, to understand what's going on, but uh, there is further work that's required to, to take this forward. So um, thank you very much and uh, I'll just leave it there. Thanks very, very much, Jonathan, for sometimes introducing uh, difficult concepts around uh, trade-offs um, and, uh, you know, just highlighting the challenges we face in terms of striking that balance between societal, economic and environmental uh, issues, of the, which is a plethora of. Um, and uh, it will be all about trade-offs, which, which means uh, we have to work together on this um, uh, just to prevent unintended consequences. Um, uh, our next speaker is um, uh, Dr. Billy Hunter from the Fisheries and Aquatic Ecosystems Branch with an AFP. Uh, Billy is um, uh, joined AFP quite recently in 2020. And previously, he has been an environmental science uh, lecturer at University of Ulster. Ulster. Um, but he's a marine chemist uh, with an interest in how environmental change can affect carbon and nitrogen cycles. So uh, just moving from terrestrial to the water uh, for our last speaker. Thank you, Billy. Okay. Uh, thanks, PJ, for the introduction. And thanks to all the other speakers. Um, I guess it falls to me to close the show today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about carbon sequestration and the potential for carbon sequestration in uh, Northern Ireland's aquatic environment and what evidence we need to be able to, to achieve that. And if you think about carbon, um, particularly, you know, thinking about it in the agriculture setting, you know, a, a key aspect of that is biomass and biomass means wealth. So it, it, it very much equates to treasure. And in, you know, if we're burying, if we're burying, uh, if we're burying wealth, uh, you know, uh, it, particularly in marine environments, it, it draws it draws the mind to uh, pirates, and particularly this group here who are uh, rather inefficiently working to bury some treasure. <laughs> so, just to take a step back, you know, you have to think about the carbon cycle um, on a broader scale. Um, 
So we, we typically think about the aquatic carbon cycle, but there really aren't any boundaries. We've created these artificial boundaries between land and sea and land and lakes. They all sort of blur together. And globally, we have about 3.3 billion tonnes of carbon enter our, the aquatic environments from the land. Um, roughly, most of that's off-gassed and ends up back in the atmosphere, but about 18% accumulates in, la in lakes and about 30% reaches the oceans. And if you want a, a kind of a like-for-like, like, roughly the same amount of carbon that accumulates in terrestrial ecosystems, in soils, in forests, accumulates in oceans and in the sea. So this is really uh, understanding what goes on, the processes that drive carbon accumulation and carbon burial in lakes and, and on, our, on our seas is really essential if we're going to maximize carbon sequestration and meet those net zero goals. So to kind of contextualize that, you have about 38 trillion tons of carbon already in the sea. That's about 2,000 years worth of uh, carbon dioxide emissions at the current rate. And the sea has already absorbed about 40% of our emissions uh, since it started the Industrial Revolution. So without the sea, without the lakes, we are in big trouble in terms of climate regulation. And something controversial for you all, uh, particularly those of you in Fermanagh where it's nice and sunny, Northern Ireland is a very wet place. You know, we have a land area of about 14,000 square kilometres, um, of which about 4% is covered by lakes. There's 10 major river systems, and then our, sea, our coastal seas account for about 67% of the land area. So we are very intimately connected to the water, and it's Northern Ireland's water wealth, which is really one of our key resources. It's essential in terms of you know, being an island nation, the, the, in terms of meeting those net zero targets, looking at blue carbon storage and understanding the processes that drive, uh, drive the accumulation of carbon in these aquatic environments is really essential. So in the aquatic environment, you can imagine it, it's very much like a, like a field with some cows in it, only upside down. So, you have the phytoplankton up at the top. This is your algae. These are your plants, your grass. They absorb carbon dioxide from the water. And they then convert that into sugars, build biomass. They get eaten by things. So they get eaten by zooplankton, um, which I guess are your cattle. Um, and they, they then do their bit. They're messy eaters, so they, they slough bits of food off and drop them. They poo and produce fecal pellets, and then they get eaten by fish. And fish are what's really important here, because in a sustainable ecosystem, be it a lake, be it the sea, where you have active fisheries, this is, where your, 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 this is your biomass that you can extract. Some of the, obviously the fish then produce fecal pellets, that ends up at the seabed or the lake bed, and there are animals at the seabed that are, or, or the lake bed, which are uh, then consuming and processing that carbon as it reaches the, the bottom. And again, you know, thinking about the Irish Sea where scampi are king, we have, uh, we have nephrops, so prawns down there, which are very much active. So in terms of thinking about carbon in the aquatic environment, carbon it really is the functional unit of energy transfer. It is the common currency that allows energy to move through the system and biomass to accumulate. So there is a, there is a, there is a clear, there's a clear balance that we need to make between maintaining sustainable fisheries and maintaining sustainable marine and aquatic ecosystems against maximizing carbon storage to meet those climate goals. And that's a real challenge because what we're looking at and where we're looking to go is moving from an economy where we have traditionally removed, uh, removed carbon in the form of hydrocarbons or oil from the seabed. Um, I'm sure some of you would, would recognize Larry Hagman. This is J.R. Ewing. And it's a fundamental shift because we're going to be trying to be less like J.R. and more like Captain Pugwash, putting that material back into the seabed and storing it there. Um, and that's really the, the key challenge that we have. Now, one consequence over the last number of years since COVID started is that Academics, uh, scientists, environmental scientists 
uh, were left with crayons and maps, and they started to draw pictures. And this is one of the key things that we need to understand is how much carbon is currently stored in lake beds and in the sea, in seabeds. The issue that we have is that we are, we are working with a data poor, in a data poor environment. So there's been a number of very high profile papers put out about carbon stocks in the UK's uh, exclusive economic zone in the seabed. They're largely based on carbon, uh, sediment cores taken in a few sites in the North Sea. They don't, they're not representative of the whole UK seabed. And alongside that, we don't necessarily have the accurate seabed maps to make broad inferences. So what you don't see when you see maps like this about, uh, about the sensitivity to fishing pressure, you don't see the uncertainty values around, the, around those carbon stocks. And that's really the key thing. If we're gonna effectively manage carbon, carbon sequestration and burial, we need to know where it's going, and we need to know how long it stays there. So we need accurate data. And this is the key issue that we face. So with that in mind, um, I'm gonna give you a quick tour through the current state of the work that's currently being underdone at AFP, uh, within AFP and more broadly. Fundamental to this work though, is the platforms that we have to do it. So without having access to things, resources like uh, our research vessel uh, up in the top right here, we don't really have the capacity to, to collect the data that's needed to make these policy decisions. So these, these research platforms are really essential to the delivery of this, these broad programs of work. So at the moment, we're engaged in a two-year project funded through uh, DRA AMI funding to map carbon storage in Northern Ireland's uh, aquatic environment. That cuts across both the marine and the freshwater environment. And it ties, to, it ties in with a number of other efforts across the UK. So there's, there's complementary work being done in England by CFAS and complementary work in the south uh, being carried out by the Marine Institute. So there's a, this is a, a huge... Uh, effort across, which, which will yield information across the, a large area of the, the Western European shelf seas. It aligns very much with the need for evidence to, to support DERA's blue, blue Carbon Action Plan and more broadly the Green Growth Strategy. And ultimately the aim is to sort of get the baseline data and start to make some assessments about how environmental and human pressures drive Carbon, uh, carbon sequestration or the removal of carbon from these sediments. So we started we, by um, sampling a large area of the, the, um, the Western Irish Sea, so the Northern Ar with a particular focus on the muddy sediments in, the, in, in, uh, in Northern Ireland's waters. Um, so this is a deep offshore muds that are likely to accumulate carbon. Um, we've been undertaking mapping to, to map the extent of those areas, um, and this has been largely done with uh, multi-beam so sonar surveys. But to, to fully understand this, we need to go further. We need to develop capacity in sub-bottom profiling to measure how thick the mud is, and that will give us an indication then of how much carbon potential there is to store in those areas. Alongside the mapping, though, we've also been out um, directly taking samples and measuring how much carbon and what the quality of the carbon is in those sediments. So we, we were out, I was out in May 2022, um, and we sampled about 50 stations across the, across the area. And we, we've, um, we're currently working those, those data up to build, a, to build a, a, a model in terms of the amount of carbon currently stored in that sediment. One thing that we can see, you know, if you look at it, a lot of that carbon is derived from the plankton, the, the, the algae that sinks down from the water column, and that's spatially heterogeneous. It doesn't, it, it do, it doesn't just deposit anywhere. So there are hot spots of, of higher carbon and hot spots of, um, and, and areas of lower carbon within this area of supposedly homogeneous mud. And we're building up this picture at the moment in terms of the spatial distribution of carbon. So this is the, this on the right is a map showing the um, the stations that we're, we're the stations uh, that we've sampled so far and analysed for carbon total carbon stocks. And it and you can see that there is spatial variability 
And we can then use this alongside longer term data sets that we have which show the, 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 the long term changes in carbon storage within these sediments to, to start to understand how much carbon is being, being accumulated and what the potential is for future carbon storage, um, perhaps under different management regimes. So I would sort of point out, you know, typically we're looking at between one and 2% carbon storage within the sediments. Um, and a lot of that carbon is fairly refractory. So it's, it's not likely to be broken down or relatively um, reactive if it was disturbed at the moment. Now, there are questions about why that is, and uh, you know, there are technical aspects that we need to delve into to, to address whether that's because this is just the remnant from material that's disturbed or, or not. But we're matching that. It's not just in the marine environment. We're matching this work in the freshwater environment. And uh, I'm working with colleagues in AFI. So uh, the freshwater aspects around Loch Ney being led by Yvonne McAlarney to map the amount of carbon stored in Loch Ney sediments and to build a mass balance of the carbon inputs and outputs of the loch. And alongside that, we're looking at the high frequency monitoring of carbon fluxes through a model catchment in the west of Ireland, uh, the west of Ireland, the Derg catchment, to understand how seasonal changes affects the flow of carbon through our river systems. And I think, you know, it's, at this point, it's good to sort of highlight that piece of work because carbon flux through our rivers is really critical to, to understand uh, water quality. Um, we don't want high levels of dissolved organic carbon in, in, those, in, in catchments where we, we have water, water abstraction going on for uh, human use. So there is a balance there between maximizing carbon transport and carbon storage, and also the other uses of the, of the, the aquatic space. And in this case, uh, this is following a peat slide in the, in the dirt catchment. Uh, a colleague, um, Phoebe Morton, brought this, uh, brought this study to us, and we, we, we started to, to analyze the high frequency data, and it then built into a longer term seasonal monitoring of the the catchment in terms of carbon stocks. And what's really interesting about this, I mean, aside from the fact that these aren't islands, these are trees washing down, this, washing down the river, is the fact that the dissolved organic carbon is very much uncoupled from the peat slide. It's tied to when you get, when you get peaks in flood material, uh, uh, peaks in flow, rather than necessarily the, the deposition of large amounts of soil into the system. So going forward, how do we move on from this? So in terms of the outlook, first of all, we need to build a, we need to build a network. We already have, a, in Northern Ireland, a, a, a world-leading network of uh, oceanographic moorings around our coast and a long-term oceanographic mooring in the Western Irish Sea, which is the longest uh, chemical oceanographic data set and one of the longest uh, temperature data sets in the UK. So we have this climactic mo climatic um, monitoring network already in place. We need to extend that to allow us to measure carbon fluxes and to understand what the, what the processes are around, uh, around carbon flow into the environment. We can then use that building on the 20 years of uh, experience that AFPI has built up and expertise in monitoring catchments to start to to start to understand how carbon flows through, those, through these catchments will change and how that's driven by land use change. So we can produce the predictive models to let you know how changes in farming practices will affect the water quality and the flow of carbon and potential for carbon sequestration in our aquatic environments. But we need to, we need to have the data in place to then ground truth those models. Likewise, in the marine space, um, we need to balance carbon sequestration against sustainable fisheries management. Um, one of the key things about the RSC is we have developed over, over many decades a relatively robust set of ecosystem models to allow, um, allow us to um, effectively manage the fishery. And with that in mind, we, we, can in, we can then build carbon sequestration and the deposition of carbon into those models and, you, and, and incorporate that into the decision-making process. But it, but it requires us to, to take steps in terms of the models to, uh, 
and, and providing the data to the, those models to allow us to do that. And alongside that, uh, my colleague Christian Wilson, who's not here today, um, is, is, is uh, leading work in terms of coastal carbon uh, se sequestering habitats of salt marshes and seagrass beds. And he is uh, developing a, a project, project around uh, how we can restore carbon sequestration in those coastal wetlands because they have huge potential if managed correctly to sequester carbon and store that over millennial scales. So just as a last point around this, there are, you know, to achieve the aims we have in terms of net zero and to move forward actually beyond that and think about ensuring that we minimize our, our future impact on the climate, we need to take into account the fact that the climate is changing and that comes with adaptation challenges in terms of carbon sequestration. So the first, we're already seeing climate, uh, climate extremes happening in our, in our waters. So the graph on the left, that shows the heat wave event that we saw in July 2021 in the Western Irish Sea. So this is the, these are the highest temperatures ever recorded in the Irish Sea, uh, up to 19.7 degrees centigrade. Uh, it's a huge warming event in that respect. So how are the, we, we need to ask questions about how these, these extreme events are likely to affect the, pr the, the processes that ultimately determine whether carbon is sequestered or whether it's then released from the oceans. And tie that in with other aspects, so things like species loss and the, the, the effects of changing, um, changing ecosystem dynamics. Because there are studies um, like the one that I'm showing here from a piece of work I did when I was at Queen's, which show that, which show that removal of just one species under different climate regimes can totally flip the capacity for carbon sequestration in the environment. And as a last point, you know, in our inland waterways, again, coming back to extreme events, uh, rainfall values, we're, we're gonna face more extreme rainfall events. Um, and that's likely to drive increased flux of organic carbon through our inland waters. There's one last point that we sort of have to raise, which is in terms of adaptation challenges, and that's really around offshore wind and the move to renewable energy. So we need to understand a lot more about the potential impacts of this. Uh, there's been a number of studies done, particularly in the Belgian North Sea around offshore wind, which show that it has, it, there's a very fine balance because the installation of the wind turbines themselves cause a huge amount of disturbance and the release of a large amount of carbon from, the, from marine sediments. But the flip side of that is that Firstly, they provide an area of protection um, of the seabed. And they also, because of the, the encrusting animals that, that, that colonize these wind turbines, they provide a route for enhanced carbon deposition down to the sediment because the encrusting animals produce feces, which, which essentially pumps carbon down to the seabed. The last point, and it's just really kind of to close this off, is that alongside all these 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 uh, issues around the outlook. We need to be looking much further in terms of what innovative tools there are out there to support carbon dioxide removal and carbon sequestration in the marine environment. And we need to, but we need to balance that against their potential environmental impacts. So looking at the potential for things like shellfish aquaculture to maximize carbon removal in uh, our estuarine environments and the store and, and enhance its storage and and the valorization of shellfish waste to uh, as a potential um, as a potential alternative for uh, soil liming or for uh, building materials and some of the engineering approaches perhaps around uh, ocean alkalinity enhancement where you increase the amount of the carrying capacity of, the, of regions of the sea for carbon dioxide storage which could provide ways to intensify shellfish and uh, macroalgal aqu aquaculture at a limited scale. But with that in mind, there are huge caveats about the wider potential environmental impacts and it, it, needs, it needs to be further investigated. So that brings me to a close. Uh, I'd just like to kind of thank 
the huge number of collaborators across AFI, both within the Fisheries and Aquatic Ecosystems branch and also the Agri-Environment branch who, who have been involved in this project. Um, I've also working with uh, colleagues at UU and uh, the Northern Ireland Fisheries, Fishermen's Federation around, uh, around uh, minimizing the impacts of fishing pressure on the, on the seabed and assessing that. So uh, it, it's really key to highlight the fact that the, this work requires broad scale collaboration and it requires collaboration and engagement with the stakeholders on the ground to, to develop solutions that ensure that we balance carbon sequestration against the sustainable management of our marine aquatic resources. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Billy. Um, Look, being the last session, you know, you, you start on the back foot in terms of timing and uh, then you have a bunch of uh, very enthusiastic presenters. It makes it even worse. So we'll have a, a very short discussion session. I know people uh, need to uh, get home uh, and we've all passed the, the planned time. So uh, just um, want to invite the uh, speakers back to the stage please we were hoping to get dr lisa norton as part of the discussion too but unfortunately she can't join us virtually so i also like to to call to the stage uh, claire vincent who's the deputy director with Indira's environment marine and fisheries group and uh, mr kevin duncan who's the land use and farming advisor for the national trust So just, uh, I mean, obviously the, the theme of this session has been extremely wide. Um, so the question that came in is sometimes very specific and almost uh, linked to the previous expertise in the previous sessions. So uh, just in interest of time, I'll, uh, I'll uh, just focus on the more general um, questions that came in. Um, so first of all, some just very few specific on uh, expertise of the of the speakers itself, um, uh, and I'll um, probably direct this one uh, to Archie. Um, in terms of uh, semi-natural grassland and species richness of of uh, haze and hay and semi haze and things like that, in terms of uh, um, management for biodiversity and, and uh, has there been any work done on that? Thanks for the this is working. Um, I, I think in, in slightly outside my field but I think about invertebrate uh, biodiversity um, you know it, it always does better um, with a greater plant biodiversity so anything that's semi-natural it, it is going to have um, greater uh, insect diversity. Um, I think on, on a broader scale, one thing I'd like to, to, to just mention, this, and I hope you don't mind me going broader, is that you know, if you look at Ireland h historically and, and back in the past, you know, it, it was um, forested, but it was also um, populated by, by large ungulates. So I know that when we were talking about invertebrate um, biodiversity, um, a lot of the, the systems rely on grazing. So rely on you know, keeping um, the grass and, and keeping other plant species from dominating. And so you maintain uh, the semi-natural environment. Otherwise, it goes into um, you know, to, to, to sort of copse development and eventually into forest. Um, so I know, I know that's the case in conservation of like, like large blue butterfly, which are a very complex system. Um, that involves different hosts and alternating between even ants are involved and things like that. So, yeah, I, I would, I would, I would just say I think there's a big role to play uh, in semi-natural grassland, certainly in biodiversity conservation. Thank you very much. Um, another question here on uh, the potential of uh, Billy Touch and his uh, presentation, geoengineering. So this is taking it back to soils. Um, 
and whether there's any potential for soil amendments, you know, in terms of biosolids and things like that to improve soil carbon sequestration, um, and also part of the wider biocircular economy. Uh, is, is that part of the solution, Jonathan? Yes, I mean, I think uh, there's, there's lots of um, possibilities in terms of, of um, it really comes down to the question, we, you know, what do we want to achieve? And, and I should have emphasised more strongly that in general grasslands are a, a sink for carbon. And, and, I, and I think we have to recognise that, you know, I gave just a few selected examples and across those examples we had some trade-offs we had some synergies and we had areas where there's uncertainty. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's possibly certain um, amendments which do need more work, um, certainly for this environment, or we have to look um, internationally for other studies. Um, but, yeah, definitely I agree that um, that, that should be considered um, as part of going forward. Um, this is probably... A a question for, for Kevin to start this off. Um, should we adopt more rotation in our land use? Um, that's quite a big question, but in, in short, yes, um, I, I would say so. Um, particularly in the arable um, setting, if you keep doing the same thing year on year, you're going to deplete that soil and also build up a lot of pests. The microphone's not working. Sorry. I'm just my voice is usually loud enough to yeah. give me air uh, without it for anybody um, that knows me. <laughs> but you um, you, uh, quite interestingly, I've been working on a crop plan for uh, Benarbal area uh, that's just been uh, barley year and year for, for about 40 years. So what we're trying to do is bring uh, Herbalay's grass system back in for, for, for about three years to build up the fertility um, like naturally and try to move away from um, synthetic fertilizers that do cause a lot of harm um, to the soil and affects the carbon and all the rest. So yeah, having a rotation in the system, which is what farmers used to do back in the day anyway, until they get led down the pursuit of uh, following in intensive farming and all the rest. So really we have to replicate what we did in the past to go forward. I think we have a lot to learn from the farmers of the, fa of the past. Thank you. Claire, do you have any comments on that? No. Just that, um, that uh, I, I had the uh, privilege of going and seeing the, um, the, the Hillsborough uh, farm up at uh, Afby and um, so a lot of what David presented this morning I saw firsthand and it struck me very much that we need to learn back from our forefathers and, and uh, I suppose combine that with the, all, the, all the, the types of material that we've heard today but a lot of it is actually looking backwards um, but how do we how do we uh, keep people on, on the land uh, managing it in, 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 in that way? Thank you. Um, now, just in terms of the general question, there's lots of questions that came through around trade-offs. You know, should, uh, you know, Jonathan presented stuff on liming uh, and presented the pros and cons around that, and then, you know, questions around whether the impact on acidic environments like heath and peatlands has been considered. Uh, you know, the whole trade-off between soil sequestration uh, and uh, soil health to the microbiome. Um, it's just, uh, you know, balance between forestry and agriculture. Um, and, um, uh, and, you know, even uh, on the marine side in terms of, uh, you know, some of the practices um, and ocean, dis you know, ocean seabed disturbances um, versus carbon sequestration. So the trade-off thing is, is uh, you know, very much uh, coming through here. And every time you present something, somebody will ask another question. I'm going to ask uh, every member of the panel, how do we get that right? Um, I have a hard task of going first, I guess, but I, I think the best way to do that is have um, smart, top, uh, smart objectives. What are you actually asking of the farmer? In my role as a farmer advisor and working in, in England, that's been the main thing. That I'd say, what do we actually want the farmers uh, um, to do? There's so many asks that you need to have that set out in policy, what we're actually asking, but the farmers need to have an equal seat at that table so that they're involved in the process so that it's sensible and practical and you have options that they can actually do. And there's great um, examples of where that has worked uh, uh, down south and across the water where farmers did come up with practical solutions to these asked. 
I don't think it is as complicated as sometimes uh, we make it if we actually give farmers the tools to uh, deliver the outcomes they can do it. So they just need the tools to uh, do so and all the research projects uh, uh, will do that. And I particularly give a shout out to Arc Zero because uh, from what I can see, it's farmer led research and it's really showing in Northern Ireland how we can achieve like, a lot of these things. So, you know, it's funding projects like that that can really make a real uh, difference, I think, anyway. Thank you. Claire? And I'll just add to that by saying I think uh, there's no one, sing what we've really heard today, there's no one single answer on any of this. Um, data is key and understanding, um, understanding the science behind whether it's managing the land-based environment or the <coughs> marine environment. Um, and there's no one single solution because it depends. We've, we heard about our complex geology both of the, the, the land area and also of the, of the sea and that different areas are suited um, for, for, for different uses. So I'm not quite sure whether I've answered the question, PJ, but, <laughs> but I've maybe added something to it. I'll yes. hand over to Billy. Um, yeah, I guess just to kind of reinforce the, those two points. The first is that in many cases, particularly in the marine environment, we're dealing with a data poor environment. So we actually need the baseline data to enable uh, the environmental managers to ma make those decisions. And the other side of it is, and I've had discuss I've been in discussions with the Northern Ireland Fisheries Fe Fishermen's Federation and fish producers organizations, and they've been in the room with the NGOs, and they are up for the discussion. There, there is a, a willingness to engage in a discussion around this, so bringing the stakeholders into the room and actually enabling them to get together and to, to get buy-in for, um, for any changes that are made. Because ultimately, if we push, um, if we're gonna displace food production, <coughs> essentially offshore, out of, out of our territory, we're likely to then push that to areas with lower, lower levels of environmental regulation, and that's a, that's a bigger danger, are we then just are we then just um, essentially make greenwashing ourselves and, and enhancing the damage elsewhere? Thank you. Yeah, like, thanks, PJ. Like I say, my main interest in invertebrates, but I, I, I heard a, a good phrase that is, um, you can't be green if you're in the red, and I think that would be where I would leave it at that. Uh, I, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think that um, sometimes we need to be patient. Sometimes it takes a little while to work out what the effect is and, and uh, also to emphasize the uh, spatial variability. So I think time and space are two things we really need to consider with trade-offs and that what works on one farm on, in one particular field, uh, you could have another result elsewhere. And I think if you remember back to the slide I showed with the enormous difference in the carbon stocks, um, just according to the frequency of tillage. So, so I think um, that, yeah, time and space are something we need to consider carefully when we're thinking about trade-offs. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, just one last short one. So you mentioned patience, um, which is kind of contradictory to the general theme here, that we don't have a huge amount of time uh, going forward. There's uh, already, uh, you know, even legislatively, like challenging targets uh, and now eight years time. Um, uh, and with that, um, what, uh, you know, would you request from uh, the UK Prime Minister? Uh, Duncan, uh, Kevin, sorry, have a go. I think it's back to the point that I've already um, said from my uh, experience in sort of um, farming research, it's really the best things that have worked is actually farmer-led projects. So we need money to invest in local farmer projects because what w works in the east of, of Northern Ireland may not work in the west, for example, Herbalize may not do so, but we need to investigate. We need to give the skills and information um, to the farmer and the farmer really needs to be at that seat because for too long policy has been led by policymakers and not by the farmers involved. So. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, well.
I was going to make the point about um, the, a few people said, oh, we need more time. Um, we don't, um, that was a, a point, we, we don't have more time, but we've got some, we've had some fantastic pilots going on um, through Interreg, um, with potential for more pilots through Peace Plus uh, coming on stream as we speak within the next few months. And we need to keep building on that. And, but also there's a, a lot of people talk today about the communications how do we get this science out there? Um, people talked about um, the social and, and aspects and behavioral change, and how do we then move to fast, accelerated is the word being used, accelerated implementation. That's absolutely huge. I, I was chairing a, a meeting a couple of weeks ago um, on, on one of the pilots that I've been involved with in Dundrum, and um, was talking about the um, uh, the, 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 the science that we're bringing forward, the fantastic science that's going forward, but in some ways we have to challenge ourselves as a science community here. Are we failing in, in that if we're not actually managing to change things? So I think that's a really big uh, question for us um, going forward is how do we mainstream some of the great stuff that we've actually heard today? Mm -hmm. On that challenge, um, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll end the session um, just looking at the time. Thanks very much for, for, the, for the panel and their contribution. Yes, actually, a great place to leave uh, the conference for today. Let's take these messages forward. And uh, uh, fabulous to have been here. A big round of applause to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you to Peter Jan and to Alistair and to Elizabeth for chairing uh, those sessions fantastically. It's been wonderful to be here as your MC. Uh, but now we're going to go right back to the man who opened up the conference way back this morning. And we're going to invite Stanley up to say the closing words. But take care and safe home, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. I'm conscious that time's moving on and everybody's obviously keen to get home, but I'd like to say just a few closing remarks to bring today's conference to conclusion. A huge thank you firstly to all of our speakers for the excellent presentations we've heard today. Also to our panel members for your contributions to the various discussions and at times lively discussions we've had. To EMT colleagues, Elizabeth, Alistair and Peter Jan for chairing today's sessions, but also all of the really hard work that's gone on in the background to make today possible. Conference like today requires significant efforts in the background, so thanks also to the AFPE comms team, to our external conference support company, to Sarah and to the hotel who has fed and entertained us so well today. Thanks also to DERA, um, AFPE is an arm's length body of the department and we rely on the DERA funding to make much of the signs which you've heard today possible. Today's conference, as I said at the outset, was about what is arguably one of society's greatest challenges, that of climate change and the challenge of carbon and beyond. I think our speakers have absolutely risen to that challenge. They've given us some really excellent talks which have spanned from the soils to the pasture, to animal production, to animal health, ecosystems, plant health, and the marine environment and the importance of blue carbon. No single solution, as we all know, but a possibility of bringing all of that together into a holistic solution that addresses the challenges that we face. I have certainly, and I hope you have as well, found today incredibly interesting, thought-provoking, and worthwhile. But it's also been inspiring, inspiring that science will help deliver answers and solutions to the challenges ahead, and with solutions comes opportunities opportunities for the agri-food industry, opportunities for the wider economy, and the opportunity for society as a whole. Finally, I would like to thank all of you who have attended today. It's really appreciate and great to see the attendance we've had. And finally, wish you a safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you.